Hi, I'm Dan Martin. I'm the Safe Community Coordinator for the Village of New Lenox. And we're at Lincoln Way West High School right now for Your Light Still Shines. It's a big event in support of International Overdose Awareness Day. We have a lot of activities going on right now. We have medication take back. We have the Hero and Will County Sheriff's Police hidden in plain sight trailers outside. They give you an idea of what a teenager's bedroom looks like and all the different hiding spots uh, for paraphernalia, drugs, things like that. Inside, we have about 35 organizations, informational tables. People can come along and, and talk to people, get great information. At uh, 6.30 p.m., we're going to do Narcan training. Dr. Kathleen Burke from the Will County Health Department is going to do Narcan training from 6.30 to 7. And at 7 o'clock, we've got some great speakers. Uh, our keynote is going to be Tom Farley. He's the brother of uh, deceased actor Chris Farley. He's going to tell his story and actually moderate a panel of great speakers tonight. So uh, really happy to be here. Thanks in advance to everybody that came out to join us. Hi, I'm here with Mary Ann from NAMI. Yes. Mary Ann, what brings you out here to our event? Well, NAMI has free educational programs that help family members learn about mental health. And so I think it's very important to get uh, our literature out so they know that they have somewhere to go to learn about mental health. And how can people find out or get in touch with NAMI? They can go to NAMI South, NAMI South Suburbs of Chicago org. That's our website. Or they can also go to NAMI.org and put in their, uh, their state or wherever they're from, and it will list every affiliate in that state. Is there anything else you'd like to add about NAMI? Um, well, I think that, well, NAMI saved our lives, and that's why I'm so dedicated in, in helping uh, other families learn that the much as, to learn as much education as they can so per the person that's living with the illness can get on with their life. There is hope, there is recovery, but families need to be educated. All right, thank you. And that's Marianne from NAMI. Hi, I'm here with Danita from Got Naloxone. Danita, what brings you guys out here to this event? We are with the Will County Substance Use Initiatives through the Will County Health Department, and our goal is to distribute Narcan and fentanyl test strips throughout the Will County area to ensure that people are educated on how to use it and educated regarding substance use disorder. And can you tell us what it actually does? It reverses the effects of the opioids on the brain. And so then that way, for a, a little bit of time before the EMTs can get there, it can actually save somebody's life. We still suggest call 911 because all it does is it reverses the effects of the opioids on the receptors just long enough for the EMTs to get there. They could get up, walk away, and overdose again. It doesn't remove the heroin. And is there a way for people to contact you, find out a little bit more about your organization? Yeah, our director is Connie DeWall, and her number is 815-603-6844, or we have our rapid recovery response team, and we're all on Facebook, and we share all the events that we're at. We go to pretty much all the fairs, festivals, food pantries, and everything throughout Will County, so we make sure that we're out there and we're known to the public. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I just like to add that there's a stigma around, you know, substance use disorder, but there's also a stigma around having Narcan in your car to save somebody. A lot of times we hear people say, I don't know anybody with a drug problem. It's not just people with a drug problem, though. There are people who accidentally take too many prescription pills. Or you have the recreational cocaine users who don't expect to die, but then fentanyl is being put in their supplies. And I just feel like there's that stigma and we want to get rid of it and we like to say it's better to have Narcan and not need it than need it and not have it and say I wish I grabbed that box. All right, thank that's good advice. And that was Danita from Got Naloxone. Hi I'm here with Marianne from Families Anonymous. Marianne tell us a little bit about your organization and what brings you here to this event. Hi um, we are a 12-step fellowship program and we help people, uh, families who have uh, loved ones with addiction problems or mental illness. And um, we are a support group. And when they come to our meeting, they know that they are not alone, that there's many other uh, people with loved ones on substance ab uh, abuse problems. All right. Is there a way for people to find you or get a hold of you? Yes, they can go to familiesanonymous.org. And right now we are um, uh, via Zoom because, uh, you know, because of the pandemic. But soon we'll be back in person again. Okay, that's great. Yeah. 
Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, if anyone has any problems, please don't be afraid uh, to come. You know, everyone is afraid their first time, but once they come, you know, they keep coming back. So. All right. All right. Thank you. That's Marianne from Families Anonymous. Hi, I'm here with Cherie with Families United Overcoming Addiction. Cherie, tell us what brings you out here to this event. Hi, well, I facilitate family support groups for families that have a loved one um, that suffers from substance use disorder. And I come to this event because it's important to get the information out. Years ago, there were no family support groups. And fortunately now, we do have several family support groups because parents don't know what to do. Um, you know, it could be a minor child, it could be an adult child, or it could be a spouse. They don't know what to do, they're lost. Um, so I remember feeling like that when my family was going through this, and I want to help anybody that I can. So we provide resources, we provide educational material, we try to educate people on addiction, um, break that stigma. Um, mental health and addiction kind of go hand in hand and there's a stigma with both. Um, so we just try to help people through that any way that we can. My group uh, meets on Tuesday nights at Community Christian Church in Plainfield. And I also uh, do it via Zoom. Uh, so we do in person and Zoom. And on Wednesday mornings, I do a group just online, just Zoom. So um, anybody can contact me. Um, they can contact me through the church if they want, or they can contact me through familygroupshelps.com. All right, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, that's all. Thank you. All right. That's Cherie from Family United for Addiction. Overcoming Addiction. Hi, I'm here with Heather from Solid Ground Sober Living. Heather, what brings you here to this event today? Um, to help raise awareness and to get info out that we do have men and women sober living houses out here in Joliet. Um, and if anybody is looking for more information, they can call or text at 630-740-0479. Um, all the info is also available on www.solidgroundhousing.com. Okay. And do you provide living facilities for people that kind of just need a little holding hand? Yes, yes. So it's residential homes. Um, the men are separate from the women. Um, there's about nine guys in each home and they are held accountable. We do have a list of rules and guidelines and they are expected to be going to meetings, clean drops. Um, working with the sponsor, working a 12-step program. And is this temporary housing? How long do you, do you think people actually like stay here? So there is no minimum or maximum requirement. It's really what are the needs of you. Do you need this for a month and you're back on your feet or do you need this for two years and you're back on your feet? Um, all of our houses, we also work with peer support specialists that will come in and work one-on-one -on -one with each resident in the house to kind of create a wellness plan, um, what else they need help with throughout their recovery journey. Not just recovery-related things, but open court cases, DCFS, link cards, do they need help with toiletries, creating a resume, looking for a job all of the other things to kind of get them into society. All right, that's good to know. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just give me a call if anybody knows anybody in need of help. All right, thank you. And that's Heather from Solid Ground Sober Living. Hi, I'm here with Kim from Lewis University. Kim, what brings you out here to our event? I am here to represent Lewis University. We have a master's in clinical mental health counseling program where we train people to be counselors at the state level. In addition to our master's program, we also have an advanced training program in addictions where students can earn their master's degree plus the requirements to uh, become a licensed substance abuse counselor as well in order to give back to the community. And how can people find more about your programs? Who can they, can they contact Lewis University? Is there a website, a phone numbers? Yes, yeah, so our website is www.lewis, which is L-E-W-I-S-U dot E-D-U. And you can just look on the links for the programs and look for the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. Okay. And is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I would just say for all of those that work in the field that we're definitely grateful and the community is in need of more trained counselors. All right, thank you. And that's Kim from Lewis University.
Hi, I'm here with Heidi from Joliet Junior College. Heidi, what brings you out here today? Hello there. We're here to network with our other community partners. Uh, I'm a student wellness advocate at Joliet Junior College, and we are supporting all students who are enrolled at Jun Joliet Junior College. Or if you know a student enrolled at Joliet Junior College, you can uh, refer them to our student mental health and wellness program, uh, where we provide students with counseling sessions. Uh, is there uh, any other way people can contact you to find out more about this program? Sure, they can contact me at Joliet Junior College, H. Stuckel, S T U K E L, at jjc.edu, or they can give me a call at 815 280 2677. Is there anything else you'd like to add? We are so grateful and thankful to be here, building relationships with our community partners. Um, if we have students that need support uh, beyond what we can provide at JJC, we refer to our wonderful community partners which are here tonight. All right, thank you. And that's Heidi from Joliet Junior College. Hi, I'm here with Brandon from Illinois Supply Company. Brandon, what brings you out here? Uh, well, tonight is, is all about overdose prevention and um, we make products that make naloxone uh, the antidote to opioids more accessible in public places. So we have a variety of cabinets and cases that get installed in public buildings and schools and parks and homeless encampments and uh, you name it, we've got a cabinet or a case for every type of situation and um, basically by getting trained on how to use Narcan, you can save a life in the event of an overdose emergency. And uh, once you know how to do it, then you need the supplies to do it. And uh, in this little box is uh, two doses of naloxone. And uh, all of our cabinets uh, include uh, naloxone and instructions and uh, enables you to give the spray and save the person's life. And uh, we're installed in thousands of buildings across the United States and uh, you can visit IllinoisSupply.com or NaloxoneBox.com uh, to learn more about the products and request a catalog. And if you want to look over here real quick, there's a, um, another one of our products called the Live Safer, which is a cabinet that is specifically uh, used in schools and big public institutions that holds uh, a whole number of different uh, first aid supplies, including EpiPens, defibrillator, a choking rescue device called LifeVac, and uh, everything from albuterol inhalers for asthma attacks to epilepsy medication. You can configure this cabinet to hold anything that you want uh, to be available to your stakeholders uh, in a public building. And so uh, that's about it. That's what we do, and uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, giving us a, a chance to, to pitch our products. And again, it's IllinoisSupply.com. All right, thank you. That's Brandon. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm here with Chris from the New Lenox Police Department. Can you please tell us what brings you out here to this event? Oh, uh, well, we uh, are happy to come out here and help uh, with the program. Uh, what I do uh, at the police department is help uh, uh, dispose of over-the-counter and prescription drugs uh, so that they're not being put back in our streams and our and our you know water supplies and stuff like that. So we provide a program. Uh, at the PD to take care of those prescription drugs. And <laughs> it looks like we have a bunch right here. Uh, we'll just toss them in there. And, uh, you know, it helps keep them from getting into our, you know, into our environment. Okay, can, uh, what are the hours people can drop the, uh, the, uh, the prescription? Hours at the, the hours at the police department are 8.30 to 5. And uh, we have a vest, uh, we have a, a receptacle in the police department, uh, um, vestibule there that uh, they can drop stuff off at. All right, so people just come in during the regular hours? And during the regular hours and the office staff there will help you direct you to where you should drop them off. All right, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, the, we, we take over-the-counter and prescription drugs, no sharps and no controlled substances. So um, that's that's what we provide the service is, is, is about. So. All right, thank you. And that's Chris from the New Lenox Police Department. Hi, I'm here with Scott from James Glasgow, our state attorney for Will County. Scott, what brings you out here today? So we're here on behalf of James Glasgow and the problem-solving courts of Will uh, County. 
um, to support this wonderful event. We want the community to know that we have problem-solving courts, we have a mental health court program, we have a drug court program, we have a veterans court program that serves individuals who are charged with nonviolent crimes, that they can come into those programs voluntarily and work with us and get treat treatment, access to treatment. So we're here to network with the other treatment providers. We're also here to learn a little bit more about Nalexone and how to basically prevent opiate overdoses. So. Okay, is there a way for uh, people can contact you guys? Yeah, we, you can contact us through our Will County State's Attorney's Office. There's a website page for the problem solving courts. And then people could reach out to our office, uh, which is 815-740-7852. Uh, which is our telephone number for our problem solving courts. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just we're glad to see so many faces around in this in this event and to see the uh, um, drug take back initiative going on and the in plain sight uh, um, trailers out there. It's super important for parents to be aware of what's out there, how things are being hidden from um, in plain view, in plain sight. So we're really proud of uh, all the initiatives that are going on in Will County, and we're uh, a glad partner in this whole process. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Rich. All right. Okay. That's James from, that's Scott from James Glasgow State's Attorney's Office. Hi, I'm here with Bonnie from the HERO organization. Bonnie, can you tell us a little bit about HERO and what brings you out here today? Sure, my name is Bonnie Tongson and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for HERO. And here we have our Hidden in Plain Sight trailer. Um, this is our adult and parent um, drug education program. And it's a mock-up of a teenager's bedroom and inside we have different um, signs of substance abuse, mental health issues. We have a ton of different hiding places um, that look like everyday items. We also have over-the-counter medications that are trending being abused. Um, and then we talk about different street drugs and the effects that they have. Can you tell us about the support groups? Sure, Hero, every Tuesday we have our family support group and it's held at Lincoln Way Christian Church. And on the fourth Tuesday of each month we have grief support group at a live church, which is in Oak Lawn. And the first and third Tuesday of the month will be at um, Lincoln Way Christian Church for our grief support. Is there a way people can contact Hero? Absolutely. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash be a hero too or www.theherofoundation.org. All right. Thank you. And that's Bonnie from the Hero Organization. I just want to quickly introduce myself. I'm Dan Martin. I'm the Safe Community Coordinator for the Village of New Lenox and I chair our Safe Community Coalition. And I want to welcome everyone to our 2022 your Light Still Shines event, which is in support of International Overdose Awareness Day. Thank you all for being here. Our Safe Communities Coalition wouldn't be possible if it weren't for Mayor Tim Balderman. He's a huge advocate of what we do in terms of injury prevention and public safety, and we couldn't do all the wonderful programs without his support. So it's my honor at this time to introduce our Mayor, Tim Balderman. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone, for being out here today. Uh, I'll keep my re uh, remarks brief. There's obviously some very important speakers you're going to be hearing from here today. But first, I want to say uh, thank you to Lincoln Way West for always being such a great host for anything we need in this community. Uh, they really are a great partner of ours here in the village. So thank you, Lincoln Way. Uh, to all of our vendors, over 30, I think 35 vendors we had out here today providing tremendous information for so many people that came through. Uh, you really made this a special event, so thank you very much uh, for being out here. Uh, Dan Martin and uh, Safe Communities, I, I tell the story quite a bit, but somebody, a resident of ours, came into my office many years ago and told me about Safe Communities. I said, wow, that sounds amazing and I've got just a guy for it and uh, boy I I'm not always right but I was right when I asked Dan Martin to chair that up because he has done the most incredible job over the last several years working with his partners in the safe communities umbrella and really building this coalition so let's hear it for Dan thank you so much for all you do 
And of course, under that umbrella, the Substance Abuse Prevention Task Force for getting this all together uh, tonight and putting it on. So thank you so much. I see so many familiar faces, people that are out there fighting day in and day out to make a difference in the lives of people who are struggling. I spent 22 years in law enforcement and a big portion of what I did was running a narcotics task force. And that was in Cook County and that was in the 80s and the 90s. And the reality was all it was about was arresting people and putting them in jail. That was all we did. Uh, there was very little hope. There was very little offer of assistance. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, as I was doing my job, I didn't know any better. I said, okay, this is the law, this is what we do. We arrest people and we bring them to jail. Uh, as I uh, got elected mayor and, and started working in the community and being involved in events like this and realizing that there's so much more that we can do, uh, we have found here in New Lenox that we do a lot more. Our police department for quite a while now uh, tells people if you are struggling, with substance abuse and you need help, you can call our police department without fear of being arrested. We will get you the support that you need. When Silver Oaks Behavioral Hospital wanted to come to our community, we said yes. We don't bury our head in the sand. This uh, substance abuse, this disease, this affliction affects people of all walks of life. And the biggest mistake we can make is by burying our head in the sand and saying, well, it doesn't happen in my town. It does happen in my town, and it happens in your town and in every town. And these are people that need our support. They don't need the stigma. They don't need fingers pointed. They need arms wrapped around. And the family members that are supporting those that are struggling need the community's arms wrapped around them. And I was just speaking to somebody out in the hallway. New Lenox, that I've been the mayor of for almost 16 years now, is a very, very passionate community. Believe me, if you go on Facebook, you'll find out just how passionate they are. But they are very compassionate as well. And in life, there is nothing more important than we can be than being kind understanding and compassionate. And so I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be out of here today. A special thank you again to Safe Communities, all our vendors, our speakers for being out here to share your wisdom and your message and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Okay. You know, the mayor mentioned, mentioned the vendors as well. Uh, you can see the table up here. They were so kind and gracious. Uh, just about every organization that was here tonight brought a really nice raffle prize. So if you didn't have enough reason to stay and listen to these wonderful speakers, I kind of like your odds here. I think, I think some people are going to go home really happy tonight. So hopefully everyone has a blue raffle ticket. Uh, if you don't, please let us know. We'll be over here. We'll get you a raffle ticket. But uh, stick around after the speakers and we'll do the raffle drawing as well. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Farley. He is the Community Relations Coordinator responsible for arranging community activities and developing business relationships in southern Wisconsin. He manages strategic relationships with local and regional referral sources and works in the community to raise awareness about addiction and mental health. Tom has a marketing degree from Georgetown University. Prior to joining Rosecrans, he ran the Chris Farley Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to substance use prevention. He also served on the Dane County Human Services Board. In addition, Tom is a nationally known advocate for prevention, treatment, and recovery, and is the New York Times bestselling author of The Chris Farley Show. Please welcome Tom Farley. Thank you, thank you. Um, boy, I do an awful lot of these talks and a lot of them uh, seem to be in uh, uh, high school auditoriums, uh, which always, always brings me back to my high school experience. As a senior, I had to deal with a uh, younger brother, a sophomore uh, named Chris. And um, you know, the Chris Farley that you gotta remember from Saturday Night Live uh, at you know, 25, whatever, same guy at at 12, 15. I mean, that guy never changed. So you can imagine what it was like for me to be in, in school. I, I, I remember so many times I'd be in the hallway trying to talk to a girl 
and um, failing. And uh, around the corner comes, you know, <laughs> Jojo, the idiot clown boy. And uh, walking toward me, and I'm like, oh, boy. Just panic would set in. And he would get closer and closer. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, he'd get really close. I'm like, oh, maybe he doesn't see me. Maybe, uh, maybe just this once, he's going to spare me. And he'd get right up next to me and say something like, you know, hey, Tommy, you went to bed again last night. Mom's really mad. You know, and just keep walking. And this girl would look at me like, you know, what is wrong with your family? And I'm like, lots. <laughs> lots. Um, and now, <laughs> and now I, so I come here tonight and I, I, I see somebody in a Matt Foley t-shirt right here. So I'm still triggered. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> bring it back to my high school experiences. But, um, so, but anyway, but 25 years ago, um, I was uh, living in Connecticut. <clears throat> Chris had just... Uh, you know, spent five years at SNL in New York and with me and was out making movies. And I was in a friend's office <clears throat> and uh, we were trying to come up, he was in the entertainment business, and we were trying to come up with some kind of neat project that we could work on that we could bring Chris into. So we're going over there, all these ideas. And he had a, a TV uh, next to his desk and it was always on, apparently. Uh, and it was on CNN, and he, but it muted. And out of the corner of my eye, um, I just happened to see, you know, my brother. I see Chris, you know. <laughs> you can't escape things like that. So I see him, I'm like, oh, and I see him in spades, some clip from a movie. I'm like, oh, I, my first thought was like, well, now what has he done? And I go to turn up the volume, and I, the screen immediately goes to his uh, apartment in Chicago through uh, John Hancock, and, and, uh, and an ambulance up front, and the, and the uh, anchor is saying that uh, we're hearing that, that the actor Chris Farley um, has died of a substance, of, of a drug overdose. And, um, <clears throat> you know, from, from that point on, I, I, you know, my first thoughts, my first experience in that first year was like, nobody, nobody, nobody goes through this. I mean, it was so public, and it was so... You know, it was just all of a sudden Chris is there live, you know, on TV everywhere and movies, and then he's gone. And I'm like, and uh, I'm like, nobody has this experience like I just had, and my family just had. And boy, it didn't take me very long to realize that, yeah, actually a lot of people have had this experience. And I was amazed at that. But it, it put me on a, on a journey um, where I just felt like I need, I need to do so much. I need to talk to his fans and, and try to help them not go down that same path. So I went into schools um, with the Chris Farley Foundation, teaching them how to, how, you know, the only way my bro all my brothers learned, you know, their craft, they're all actors, um, I, I studied. Um, so... Um, uh, they learned it here in Chicago, you know, at, uh, at Second City, uh, uh, learning improv and how to connect. And so I'm like, all right, I'm not, I can't give more information to kids, but I can teach them how to use that information. So I went into schools, teaching them how to um, create ensembles, how to be better communicators, how to, how to resist peer pressure by, by connecting. So I did that for so long. Um, as was mentioned, I wrote a book, New York Times bestseller. I don't, I don't want to talk about that, but um, uh, and do a lot of public speaking. And then, and then COVID hit, and a couple of things happened. COVID hit, and um, you know, I, I did a lot of speaking. I was do, doing a lot of you know podcasts and webinars, talking about um, this coming storm. You know what's going to happen after after this pandemic. People are going to be leaving a pandemic with with behaviors they didn't have going in. And it dawned on me, like, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years talking about it. I need to, um, I need to do more than that. And so um, next thing you know, I'm, I'm at, I'm at uh, this, this wonderful um, uh, mental health and substance use treatment organization called Rosecrans down in, in Rockford, and I'm the Wisconsin rep. And now I'm actually getting people into... Uh, finding help, and, and, and I'm not just talking about them. And it, it, it's, it's been an amazing journey. It's been an amazing journey. And and, and, and then more, most recently, I, I even, you know, got into recovery myself. You know, I, I, I when I ran the Chris Farley Foundation, I had bouts of sobriety. I would put five years together and, and th think it's just about being sober. And, you know, yet I was still creating train wrecks and, you know, 
and I couldn't figure it out. And, uh, and then stress would come back in, and I would be, you know, back on varsity in no time. But, um, you know, I got back, uh, you know, I got, I finally, you know, started working my recovery program. And now that I'm working in this field, I, it's, I just brought it all together. I finally found my lane, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So, um, for 25 years, talking about somebody else's addiction and struggles, and, and yes, even some of Chris's, uh, um, successes in recovery. That was great talking about that, but now I get to talk about my recovery, and that is, uh, make, make, makes a huge difference, not just to me and my organization, but to, to everyone that I, that I talk to. So, um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey, but I, I do love to... Um, I do love, to, you know, to, you know I, I bring Chris back in because... You know, it, he's such a figurehead in, in this, you know, you know people, people that we've lost. But, you know, one of the blessings I've had with, um, with, with, with my experience with Chris is two things. You know, a year after Chris died, my dad passed away. And he was very unhealthy. And, but, you know, but, but that experience is more like most people's experience with loss. After six months, nobody asked me about my dad anymore. Nobody says, oh, I remember that great... Um, if that's my mom, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, so that's, you know, so I, I, every day somebody asks me about Chris and like, and, and remember that, you know, yes, they say, I'm sorry for your loss, but it's also a lot of, um, God, he was so funny. I loved him. You know, he was so, he, he gave so much to me. And now I tell people like, you know, especially in awareness days like this is, is you got to do two things. You've got to continue to talk about the people we lost. Because, you know, sharing that grief is uh, healing in itself. But people also have to know. Um, but we also have to, I, you know, I get a lot of, I, I don't talk about, you know, Chris's loss. I don't talk about Chris's, you know, overdose death uh, as much as I talk about, you know, this wonderful, wonderful person and that, we, that we lost. And this is what we share um, is not that, you know, we lost people, but... Um, uh, to to this horrible disease, but that that, that, that they're gone and they're, and and these you know people that that were integral to our communities and no matter where they were in their struggle, they were, they mattered, and that's what we lost. And so I really um, stress that point too. And and um, uh, you know we need to we need to talk about it, but talk about them you know all, all you know the good the good things because people won't get it. Until, you know, when we talk about loss, you know, other people won't get it until it hits them. And that's too late. We can't afford that. We're, it, we're, it, we're in, in this huge epidemic that we need, you know, we need more than just the people that are in, struggling with the disease or the people that were touched by, their, uh, by a loss. We need everyone to be focused on this. And the only way to do that is to, is to kind of, kind of flip it around and saying we're losing people that matter we were in you know don't wait for it to, to affect your life it's affecting us as a community you know a, a, a family community um state you know all at all levels um um we need to to, to keep people alive and so um i talk a lot about that and the last thing i and you know another big barrier i talk about obviously is stigma you know, and what I've been talking in Wisconsin a lot, because Wisconsin loves Chris. Um, you know, everywhere I go, they're, you know, he's, 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 he's their mascot. He's their guy, you know. And, and in Chicago, too. Chicago kind of claims him as well. But um, he, is a Pack, he was a Packer fan, so. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, but what I tell people in Wisconsin is, and this is something new for me, and this is a message I, because we're, it's, it's such a um, critical time for, for this message, I'm, I'm, I'm telling people, you can't love Chris Farley. You can't love, you know, this, this comedian, this person that, like, that brought laughter into all of our lives. You can't love that person and still have a stigma or negative thoughts about what the disease that killed him. You can't have it both ways. If you loved Chris and loved his humor, you've got to know that he's lost because of this disease. And, and, and that's got to hit home. And, you got to, you know, and I'm, I'm really challenging people with that. It's, it's um, I'm, you know, we are losing people. And so um, either, you know, 
don't say anything or like be, be, be mad or care that, that Chris is no longer here and this disease is still here. So um, those are kind of the messages that I'm out there talking. I, and again, I, I still talk about the need uh, and one, one, of the, one of the things I, I, I have always lear- uh, thought about, you know, how, how we fight this disease is through connection. And we learned this. The whole world learned it during COVID, you know. <clears throat> uh, m- most of the world experienced isolation and, um, and uh, uh, this, 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 this extreme isolation. They, they felt it for 18 months, right, two years, and they didn't like it. The rest of the world, they, they were starting fights in Walmart, getting kicked off of planes. It was, it was bad. And the thing is, there are people in our communities, in, in, in our families, that feel that way every single day of their life. You, the rest of the world didn't like it. You felt it for 18 months and they didn't like it at all. So ha- having more empathy for the people that are in isolation, struggling with this disease. And, you know, because as we said, with mental health and substance abuse, they, we, we know that they are de- diseases of isolation. That's a given. But the flip side of that is that you cannot heal in isolation. It requires connection. And we as humans are hardwired for connection. We're not here to exist any other way than to connect. So um, that's, that's my biggest message is um, on a day like this when we're remembering um, um, the people that we lost is what one of, the, one of the things that we can do and do right away is to learn how to connect not to go back to where we were before. We need to redefine connection. What's that like? What's that look like in our communities, in our schools, in our, in our state? And really dig deep on that. That's, that's, we gotta lean into that. It's all about connection, folks. And so, um, I could go on. I could go on. Um, but I will, uh, we have some great uh, people talking uh, today. And I'm going to introduce the next person. Um, on our panel, Matt Littlefield. <clears throat> uh, Matt Littlefield has a bunch of initials next to his name. <laughs> L-C-P-C-C-A-D-C. Initially, <laughs> initially graduated from college with a bachelor's degree and spent nearly 20 years working in the sports world, including 14 years in the NFL and coaching on both the high school and uh, college levels. After recognizing the need for mental health and substance abuse counseling within the community, he decided to go back to school and graduated with a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from National Lewis University and also earned his CADC. I know what that stands for. Um, Matt has worked as a uh, student advocate within the high school setting, as a mental health technician within the inpatient hospital setting, and as a clinical therapist within the outpatient PHP IOP setting at Silver Cross, Silver Oaks, and Linden Oaks over the past five years. Matt is currently working as a clinical therapist at Great Changes Counseling Services in Mokina, while also serving as a current board member and a past president of the Illinois Mental Health Counselors Association, the IMHCA. Um, throughout the presentation, Matt will provide an overview of, do I need to read this too? <laughs> Recent trends in substance abuse and treatment approaches. Matt, get up here and help me out. Um, all right, no, you got it on mic. All right, Matt. All right, is this working? Is this working? It's working for me, man. I don't know, no. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Is it on? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I am really, truly honored and humbled to be here. I want to appreciate and thank everyone here? who's here. Can you hear me okay? No, we'll switch. Yeah. I did, I did switch it. Is this working? Okay, I hear myself. So I just want to thank everybody. Like, this is so, it's such an honor to be a part of such an important event like this and bring in attention and awareness and action to this situation. And Mayor Tim and Dan and Tom, thank you for the introduction. And Rob and Michelle, thank you for all being here. Um, I want you to take one moment and look around to the side, behind you, in front of you, and in your head, count eight people. Eight people die of overdose in Illinois every day. It's going closer to nine. Also, 
for perspective, here we are in this high school. Uh, last I checked online, there's about 2,000 students that, stay, that, that go to school here. Imagine the horror thought experiment. This is not happening. This is just a thought experiment. If one grade disappeared each day starting on a Monday, by Friday there'd be no students left. No one, no staff either. We lose 287 people a day in America to overdose for perspective. And I've had to check this statistic multiple times, but believe it or not, we have lost more Americans to, in the opioid crisis to death than we lost in all of World War II and World War I combined. The magnitude of this problem is overwhelming, and what's terrific is that we're finally being able to, to give it the attention and the, that it needs. Uh, I want to start off by just sharing some concerning statistics with you, kind of to s s where we are right now, and then share with you the positive changes that we're seeing happening now. Uh, a couple of economists, uh, Deaton was one of them, and I can't, <laughs> I didn't write down the, the, the name, but they, they talked about something called deaths of despair. And that includes people who die of liver disease, cirrhosis. It includes people who commit suicide or die by suicide. And it includes overdose. We've had two million people, two million people since 2000 who have passed away from one of those three areas. So the magnitude is, is just startling. Um, I've heard someone else make the comparison that it's almost like a 747 jumbo jet crashes every single day. And very few people notice, more and more, thankfully. Um, there's some, several uh, reports and studies that are done on an annual basis. They're surveys, so they rely on people answering the questions. But basically, they found out that the past year, past month, and daily cannabis use is up to 43% in 2021, which is the highest ever recorded. Past year hallucinogen use is up to 8% in 2021, which is also the highest ever recorded. And the population that's being discussed is ages eight, uh, 19 to 30. So this isn't high school, this is 19 to 30. Past month vaping nicotine tripled, and past month vaping cannabis doubled since 2017, so that's five years. Binge drinking, and they defined it as five or more drinks in a row within a two-week period, has gone up to 32%, and that was similar, actually, to 2019. High-intensity drinking is 10 or more drinks in a row at some point in the past two weeks. That is up to 13%, which is the highest ever recorded. Only 10% of people who could benefit from treatment get access to it. Let's say that again. 10% of people who meet the diagnosis for substance use disorder and finally may be willing and ready to seek help, only 10% get that treatment. We are understaffed by threefold. We need three, three times as many counselors than we have right now just to meet the current need. And we need five times as many psychiatric nurses to meet the current need. 86% of people who meet an opioid use disorder diagnosis are not even, don't have any access to medication, which we know, based on evidence, helps people stay sober. There's some recent new drugs that are out there that are a little bit difficult to pronounce, so forgive me. There's something called xylazine, or Trank, that is now being out there. It was started out in the Northeast, and I was really disheartened to find when I checked the Will County Corners website this morning or yesterday that we've already had a few people who have passed away um, in the last few months where they had fentanyl and xylazine in their system. Xylazine is an animal tranquilizer. It does not respond to Narcan. It doesn't show up on fentanyl test strips, so if someone's trying to test and see if they're going to be okay. It leads to six to eight hours of heavy sedation. People have reported being raped and assaulted, and there are even uh, reports that some people, because of the low blood flow, because circulation stops, they've even had to have amp uh, limbs amputated. This now is in our area. 
Carfentanil, which those of you who are here from Dr. Burke's presentation, carfentanil is stronger than fentanyl. Fentanyl is 100 times stronger than heroin. So you can imagine how, how powerful that is. There's also something called paraflora fentanyl, acetyl fentanyl. And believe it or not, these are not new substances. These were discovered in 1960s. And they've been made Schedule I drugs by the DEA since that time. But now they're making a comeback, and they're killing a lot of people. We also are dealing with states um, legalizing marijuana. So they're uh, recreational cannabis states. Statistics show that there's 20% more marijuana use in states that have recreational care, uh, cannabis laws. The problem is now when we talk about marijuana or cannabis, we're not talking about one drug. The Woodstock marijuana joint from the 1960s had 3% THC in it. What you can buy right now from a dispensary can be 70, 80%, where you could be dealing with dabs and wax and shatter that's 99 or 100% pure THC. So when some people, when they first try dabbing, they pass out because it's so strong. The people in Amsterdam, who are certainly not you know, um, Puritans by any stretch, right? Famous for prostitution and for brownie shops with coffee, right, and, and marijuana. Even the people in Amsterdam have said, and they've looked at changing laws, that any marijuana that is higher than 10% THC is more like heroin or cocaine. It is not like marijuana. There's no medicinal purposes or need, ne any positive studies that have ever been done with people using THC con content higher than 10%. And so it's very confusing because there's so much information out there. There's misinformation out there. It's very confusing for people. But that's something that we're not really communicating. And I don't know whether it was just an oversight when Colorado was the first state back in 2000, the highest percent THC you could buy was 5% at that time. And now it's gone way up. There's also something, uh, I don't know how familiar people are with synthetic cathinones, which basically are called bath salts. But there's one of them called utilione, E-Y-U-T-L-Y-O-N-E, which is now killing people in Florida and Maryland. Um, I haven't seen any of it here yet. People mistakenly take it thinking that it's an ecstasy pill, but it ends up, because it's a, it's a, a synthetic substance that you're not supposed to be taking ends up killing people. And the problem is, is that it's mixed with cocaine and, and meth and as two stimulants, what they do is if you take more than one stimulant together, they potentiate one another from a chemical standpoint. So it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals seven. So it's pretty significant stuff. And there's, a, there's something called novel psychoactive substances, NPS. In the year 2021, they discovered 27 new drugs. So the way it works is that they, the, the people who are making these drugs are always one step ahead of the law. They change one little element to the chemical compound, and it's not illegal yet. And by the time the law is passed and they make it illegal, they're on to the next one. That's what makes it so hard by looking at this problem as only a law enforcement problem, like Mayor Tim mentioned. The good news is that we've made a shift now. There's a much more of a mental health, health policy perspective now. It's more about treatment, prevention. There's a lot more, even though it isn't far enough as what we want it to be, it is a lot further along than it's ever been. We have the 988 emergency line that hopefully all of you know, like at the beginning of last month or this month or last month started, so people can call and in crisis and get help. Um, Narcan, we had the presentation from Dr. Burke. It's more readily available, accessible. People know how to use it. It's saving people's lives. There aren't any other drugs on the market you could argue that could save as many people's lives if it was in more hands. Microdosing, people are doing research now and microdosing hallucinogens from a medicinal purpose to try and help people who are treatment resistant depression. Um, so that's promising potentially. Um, some people um, know that they can have a shot that can last a month or longer. They're doing different research now to even put it. So instead of a patch or instead of a pill where you're relying on that person taking it or not running out of supply or not having money to pay for it, it's a subcutaneous. So it's put under the skin and it can't go anywhere and it doesn't last. It doesn't wear off. There are actually even skin grafts now that they're talking about that people can have a little part of their place behind their ear 
put in where it gives them a certain amount of dose throughout the day and throughout weeks and months. And believe it or not, we know a lot more than we ever wanted to about vaccines, but there are people now studying how to create a vaccine that one can take in which would never allow any substance to get across the blood-brain barrier. So it could end up literally being somewhat of a cure. It's on the horizon, hopefully. Um, we also have the per prescription drug monitoring program. People in the past used to be able to go from one doctor to another and order all these prescriptions and get, and the other doctors did not know that there were other prescriptions already out there. Now we have a federal system that helps monitor that. Um, I know I'm running short of time here, but out of curiosity, um, Portugal, and I don't know how many people know this, back in 2001 legalized all drugs. They decriminalized all drugs. And instead of putting the money into law enforcement, even though the drugs were still illegal, they put it into treatment, into worker, work programs. They, they help people. They used to lose three, 400 people a year to heroin overdoses, and now it's down to 30. So they had to do a couple of little changes. And then I don't know, last thing I want to share is in Oregon, in February of 2021, they also did something similar. They decriminalized small amounts of all drugs in the state of Oregon. And they used the money from, ironically, legal cannabis sales. They used some of that sales tax money. And then they used money that they saved by not incarcerating so many people to create this program. Early returns are in. Some people would say, the critics would say it's not working. Um, people who would get found with a small amount of a substance would get a $100 citation. All someone would have to do to make that $100 citation go away is call for a helpline so they have a treatment. And up to this point, the most recent data, only 1% of people have done it. So the critics say it doesn't work. Supporters say they just, it hasn't been used long enough. People don't know enough about it. So I wanted to share that with you on a positive note. Things are getting better. The more and more events we run like this, the more people who understand that this could be anyone. This could be any one of us in this room. This could be our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our sons and daughters. And when we realize and try and fight some of the stigma, so we realize that this is not something where someone is just misbehaving, a behavior it's an illness, and we know this is scientific fact now. Back when I was growing up, it was all a behavior. It was moralized. It was, you're doing this to yourself. We know that's not true now. We know that there's a brain, biological, and physiological component to this. It is not just willpower. It is more than that. So with that, I'm going to hand you back the... <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you the microphone back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was awesome. Um, next speaker is, is Rob Finley. Rob works as a peer support specialist with the Will County Problem Solving Courts. He has been in recovery from an opioid use disorder for seven years. Rob's recovery has been successful with the help of medicated, medi medication assisted treatment. He advocates that no two people's recovery journey is identical. Finley is a combat veteran with the 101st Airborne Division, and a two-time Purple Heart recipient. Given his background, he enjoys working with veterans and others struggling with an opioid use disorder. Family feels he is a strong voice in understanding their struggles and hopefully leading them to a path of recovery. Rob? Is, your is this one working? Yes. Outstanding. Uh, forgive me, I'm not the greatest public speaker, so just bear with me here, but... Um, yeah, eight years, well, coming up on eight years in recovery, I was in the Army 10 years, and I don't know if anybody knows about Purple Hearts. You get one of those by getting injured. I caught three bullets in the chest and then shrapnel in my hip. So what do they do to keep you in the fight? Anybody? Painkillers. They just ply you with them. Give you a rotating prescription, get back in the fight, go back out there, kick it. But, excuse me. But that's how it goes that, you know, when you are on rapid deployments, it's not about your health or well-being. It's about your efficiency. And, you know, when you're a badass, you got to be efficient. But what happens when you get medical out because of your injuries? You start going to, going to the VA. The VA plies you with them, too. And then one day they say, ah, now we're done. What do you think that looks like? Like a nightmare. So what do you do? You know exactly where to get what you need because you weren't really educated on this. You know this will take away 
withdrawals. What is this? This being heroin or pills on the street. Pills on the street, they rack up quick though. Heroin was always cheaper. And then that leads you down a whole separate path. And you know, I was down that path a long time and it took me dying literally to not want to be in that path anymore. So my obsession then became learning about addiction. How can I best combat this affliction so I don't go back out there again? Started reading books, taking courses, studying actual studies that they were doing in Sweden, all, all of this, because I wanted to know what would keep me from going back out there. Lo and behold, that actually translated into a career, thankfully, peer support. Uh, ask anybody that knows me. I love working with three people, junkies, alcoholics, and veterans. Those are my people, and I love working with them. And when you're peer support, you can show them that you're the percentage that made it out, because not a lot do, and not a lot will. And I hate saying it that way. And I'm not trying to be a downer about it, but we know what the statistics look like. You know, so I feel like the more of us that are out there, I feel like we may get better results. And medication assisted treatment, I'm all for it. Now some old timers may tell you that's a crutch. You're using that as a crutch. But what happens when you got a broken leg? What do you use? A crutch. So is that a bad thing? If it keeps you alive, I'm all for it. I don't care if like praying to the rain gods keeps you alive. If it works, it works. And you know, that's my, my big theory behind it all. I just want people to stay alive. I mean, me personally, I, when I walked through that row of pictures, I counted four people that I knew personally. And that was at quick glance. Four, I'm not even gonna give you a number that I am sure on because it's disheartening. Because that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the people that are making it out. And I know a couple in here right now that made it out. And they're, not only do they make it out, they're kicking ass. And I'm, I'm loving to hear it. And with me, I was graciously hired on with Will County Problem Solving Court as peer support. And I, I don't want to be anywhere else. I love my job and I love the people I work with because they genuinely care. There's not a one of them that does not care. You go to some of these other court programs, they just warehouse you in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. No treatment. No real therapy, nothing like that. You know, that's not, that's not who I work for. And I'm proud, side thing. So a buddy of mine told me a couple of years ago, he's like, Rob, you're unkillable. You know how happy I was to hear that? I didn't realize it was a thing, but made it through war, addiction, whatever else. Apparently I am unkillable, I'll take it. I mean, I'll wear that as a badge of honor, you know what I'm saying? You know, and no, I just, with all the awareness that's coming out now, it makes me happy because this was not a thing 10 years ago, really five years ago. And with fentanyl getting put in every little thing, us at Problem Solving Court, like it gets scary because one time somebody can relapse one single time and that's it, lights out. You know, I used to tell people relapsing was like Russian roulette with one bullet in the chamber. That's changed now. Now it's four bullets in the chamber. You're more likely to die than live. And I, I, don't, want any, I don't want to see anybody go through that. I went through it for you. I want to see this somehow uh, better mediated, just more help, more people caring. That's what we really need. Because the stigma behind it, you know, that's been thick a long time. But now, addiction crosses you know, all barriers. I don't care if you're rich, poor, what kind of background you got. Somebody has been afflicted. And that's what's taking stigma away. I hate that that's how it happened, but that's why more people are wanting to learn about it now. Because they got a child, a mother, a sister, who doesn't matter. Anybody can. You know? And I just hope that we all can come together and help each other as opposed to, you know, it being a big separate thing. All programs come together and learn from one each other, or one another, forgive me on that. But uh, I think that's really all I got. Sorry, I kind of went on a rant with that one. <laughs> awesome.
And finally, we have Michelle Baikowskis, who graduated from Prairie State College with her nursing degree. She spent almost 26 years employed by Franciscan Alliance and two years at South Suburban Hospital. Almost, after almost 28 years of nursing experience, she decided to make her career a career change and work for the Will County Coroner's Office as their deputy, chief deputy coroner. She has been with the coroner's office going on two years and is very appreciative for having the opportunity to serve in this role. Despite her years employed as a nurse, working for the coroner's office has opened her eyes to the nationwide growing crisis with mental illness and drug addictions. She believes the need to stop the stigma associated with those conditions and provide the treatment to the underlying issue is crucial. Outside of her career, she plays an active role in her community as, the, as an appointed vice president of the Chicago Heights Public Library, as well as an elected commissioner on the Chicago Heights Park District. Michelle. Okay, does this work? Hello? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start out by extending Coroner Summers' deepest apologies for not being available here this evening. Try that one. Mine's always better. <laughs> Is it? Does it work? Um, there it goes. Hello? There it okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. She's out of town um, completing mandatory training. But that being said, as he said, my name's Michelle Baikowskis. I am the Chief Deputy Coroner for Will County. I have also both my cold case investigators here in the audience, uh, Gene Sullivan and Joe Piper. Together, along with our Deputy Chief, our Deputy Coroners, our Administrative Staff, and Forensic Pathologist, we all see the devastating effects of drugs on a daily basis. From January to June of this year, we had 80 drug-related deaths in Will County. From January to June of 2020, there was 74, and from January to June of 2020, there was 35. So basically, that's a 128% increase from 2020 to 2022 between the months of January and June. As of August 29th of this year, we are at 87 cases. These statistics are always being updated and are available on the willcountyillinois.com website under the coroner's site. It provides the race, age, sex, date of death, cause of death, agency that responded, and manner of death for which each year is listed. In addition to this tracking system, our office has joined ODMAP, which is a kind of real-time mapping system that allows overdose information to be logged into a centralized database system. This allows immediate responses to be taken when there's a rise or a spike in overdose events in or near your jurisdiction. The term drug no longer applies to just cocaine, heroin, and so forth. It now encompasses a larger number of medications such as opioids, benzodiazepines, which are your anti-anxieties, your anti-seizure medicines, your sleeping pills, your ADHD medicines, and so forth. But more recently, we've seen an uptick in the xylazine, as um, you had discussed earlier. Um, these are cattle tranquilizers. The abuse of these drugs alone are dangerous, but in most cases, we see in the coroner's office, these drugs are being infused with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic drug that its intended purpose was for anesthesia and end-of-life situations. It's highly potent and only, make, only takes equivalent of a grain of salt to be lethal. Fentanyl is our number one cause of deaths related to drug toxicity that we see in Will County. These overdoses, or what we prefer to refer to them as toxicities or poisonings, know no bounds. It is not discriminatory to age, sex, gender, race, or economic status. Coroner Summers has found that in most of her drug toxicity cases that she has signed out, almost all of them had an underlying comorbidity of mental illness. It's very important for people to understand that there's an array of conditions for which mental illness blankets, like anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD, OCD, eating disorders, physical and psychological addictions to pre prescribed medications as results of injuries and so forth. The stigma that surrounds mental illness and drug addictions must stop. Death by drug poisoning creates rippling and long-term effects on first responders, law enforcement, hospitals, schools, 
families, communities, and so forth. Everyone is affected. Coroner Summers is working diligently alongside law enforcement in efforts to hold these drug dealers accountable. Understand, she's not suggesting that all people in the thralls of addiction should be prosecuted, but rather triage them for appropriate care. Remember, first and foremost, the treatment of mental illness is crucial in moving forward in treating addiction. It is imperative that as a society we unite to spread the word that we're no longer going to allow the lack of accountability of the dealers nor the stigma of these conditions to be continued that change needs to take place. Talk to and encourage your local and state representatives to make legislative changes to help prosecute the dealers and to get funding to build more facilities to treat addictions and mental illness. Get involved with organizations that rally awareness. Most of these are comprised of parents who have lost a child to drug toxicity. Listen and heed their stories. Be a part of the solution. Thank you. Is this, thing, is this work? All right. Well, we're going to, um, with a little time we left, we have a few questions that we're going to ask to the um, um, panel. So I'm going to just start from the bottom and see if we can get through some of these. Um, the first thing is, uh, the first question is, is, how can the community better support overdose awareness and prevention efforts? And I'm just going to start off by saying, you're here today. You know, you're here today, which is wonderful, and, I, and I'm so grateful that you are, but, but leverage it. You know, it's the summertime. You're going out uh, to barbecues. You're going, you know, you, and, and around those places, in these public places. Uh, you know, I know we love to talk about our safe things, like, you know, um, uh, you know, the Cubs and the Bears. But, you know, those aren't pleasant conversations, but they're safe um, sometimes. Uh, so um, maybe... Talk about this stuff. You heard some great, um, you know, statistics, and you know what's going out there. You're the ex. You're the more of an expert as they are than other people in your community, your neighborhood. So next time you're at a barbecue, this is the this is the crisis. This is the this is the the the, the epidemic that we're we're in. Get people to care too. So that's I would start right there. So anything else, you guys? Uh, I would second the same thing by being here and spreading the word. And and uh, it, I've noticed recently too. It, those who watch the news, like it's starting to lead newscasts now and starting to get more and more attention, which is good. I would also say more, um, I guess, information within the schools. I mean, junior high up to high school, I know that's young, but they're starting young as well. And I think they need to be aware of what the world looks like right now. Absolutely. Educate yourself and everyone around you. Keep talking about it. Awesome. Okay, um, who turned my, that was my background. There we go. Okay, um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you are concerned about a friend or a loved one, what can you do? Um, I, I, I would just say, you know, um, you know, connect with that person. Don't, don't be silent. Don't, I mean, show, show you care. Um, uh, yeah, just just get involved, and and it may take an awful lot of time. You may have to like go back and back and back, but don't give up. Be tenacious, and do your best to try and tell them how much you love them, how much you care about them, how much you're concerned about them. Try and do it from that perspective, from where you're coming from, so they know they're valued, they know that they're cared for. Too often, I think sometimes we attack someone for what they're doing. Stop. We attack them, and then they feel worse, and then we send them actually, ironically down the other path. So really try to tell them how much you care, how concerned you are. Make that the, the way you approach it versus these, these dramas, you know, these, these fantasy shows on TV about you know, forcing people. Try to tell them how much you love them and that you're worried. Yeah, don't, don't judge. Please do not judge them. Not one bit. If anything, you know, like they're saying, come from a place of caring, but I mean, maybe provide information. If you got an idea, maybe what type of substance they're using, have some literature. Like, hey, I'm not judging your choices, but read this, take a look at it. Yes, and, and reflect on yourself as well. You know, you don't always realize what you're 
portraying, you know, behavior-wise or facial expressions or you may be saying one thing but really inside you're thinking something else. So, you know, really turn inward and, and think about how you feel about those things and, and try to remove those negative thoughts yourself and, and be there for them and be supportive and, and find resources to go with them. You know, just be supportive. And I'm just giving a little insight of the, you know, the mindset you're dealing with, and you know, Robin knows this as well, is, is the, you know, we look for any barrier, any, any sign that that door is shutting, and they'll say, okay, well, you know, they, you know they don't, nobody cares, I don't matter. They, we, we look for those things. We look for those barriers. And we're, we're hyper, you know, uh, in, in, intensely doing that. Uh, just and anything that will bring us back into this this isolation. Um, so you need to draw them out. You draw them out and, and don't have barriers. Um, and be, be expecting them to fight back on it too. Because they may not realize that it's time to, to quit. They may not want to quit. You know, and that's a hard conversation to have. I assure you, it's the most painful thing. Because you know, you know exactly what you're looking at they don't see what you're looking at. So just be patient with them. Um, one last, another question. Recovery looks different for everyone, as, as Rob alluded to earlier. What if someone relapses? And this is something I, you know, I take from the recovery community. Um, what we do is we welcome them back in. We, 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 we know that they lost a connection somewhere. And so we don't judge. We, we accept them. It's all about acceptance and trust, and they you know, come back in. And if it, you know, that's what every, everyone needs to do. It, relapses happen as part of the, the, the process, but you, you, you need to, it, it, when, when that happens, it means somebody lost a connection, somebody isolated again. Uh, their, 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 their thinking went back to you know, where they were before. So you need to draw them back in not come up with a solution, not come up with, you know, here's what you should have done or judge it. The, 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 the first thing you need to do when somebody relapses is to reconnect. And this is something that Rob and I were talking about before we got up here, that, you know, there's so many language, uh, that languages that we use, words that we use that are dated, we need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Abuse, one of them. Mm -hmm. Because it's not child abuse, sexual abuse, it's not abuse. We now are talking about substance use disorders. Relapse, relapse has this heavy, negative, you're a failure, dis, dis disgusting, dr dripping, punishing word, like that you failed and you give up. We don't do that to someone who suffers with anxiety and has a panic attack. <laughs> you're not trying hard enough, right? Like, so we gotta be careful, I think, and we have to change some of these words. Part of the reason there's stigma is because of these words we're using. And we still have some of our national organizations that still have some of these words in their title. So we look at it, and we were talking about this earlier, a slip or a lapse versus a relapse. If someone makes a mistake and they take a drink and then they, they feel bad about it and they come and they talk about it and they're honest and you're like, that can be a positive that it happened, since it happened. It can remind them, that I need to double down on my sobriety. I need to figure out, okay, what happened? What happened that led me to do that, take that drink? How did I get myself in that bar? How was I, or how did I notice? So it doesn't turn into 12, you know, a case, right? So the language we use, softening, less shame, shame inducing and shame provoking, more compassionate, more empathetic. Some of these language, these words we use, we need to change. Like with slip, slip was a big one. I mean, lapse, like you had a lapse in judgment. It happens. Come on back in, we'll work on it, you know? And a lot of people, they hear relapse and they think, well, I failed. Might as well just go right back out there, keep the show going, you know? And then, like, I always use relapse and then resume. Relapse, maybe, you know, that's, they're on their way to resuming. Like, they're already made their mind, they're on their way back out there. So we try to not use that as much as possible. Yep. You just accept them, bring them back in, show them love, and just be there for them and, and find out what it was that, that led them to that, that slip and find goals and ways to try to avoid that in the future. Yeah, you work it out 
together, mm -hmm. you know, preferably with somebody that is uh, like a peer support entity or their sponsor or somebody that just has a history, you know, who better to talk to? All right, how we, how, how we doing? Good. How we doing? Are we good? Couple more questions? Any questions out there? Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask you if you said about uh, holding the dealers responsible. I feel like I, you know, I've been a bit of a goody two shoes in my life. I, I feel like, you know, just as there's drug users all around us, there's got to be dealers all around us. And I find, feel very frustrated that I don't even know what a, a, in the year 2022, what does a drug dealer look like? What do they act like? Everybody. Even with their customers dying, there's still more coming in. It's a, uh, a running financial stream. Mm -hmm. and, and Well, there's, some are, 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 are in, in active addiction themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've got to do, you know, these are people that, that, that need um, help as well on that. So they're not just all like, you know, you know these, these business-minded people trying to, you know, some, some are in active addiction. And, you know, so. Yeah. I was going to say, like, if you do want further um, information on that. The RAND Corporation did a study a couple years ago. It's fascinating. It's very big. But basically, they, they said up until fentanyl, drug dealers would want to keep their customers. They would want to add customers. With fentanyl, it's killing people. But that, does, that doesn't seem to be the problem. And part of the reason is, and it, that, which they describe in this report, is that fentanyl is extremely cheap to make. It's extremely easy to, to cut the other drugs with. So it, they make more money. And, and like Rob said, unfortunately, even by losing customers, there's still more coming in the door. And actually, mm -hmm. ironically, in a twisted way, some people who live off heroin for a time become tolerant and they seek out fentanyl. And they seek out where someone passed away because that stuff's got to be really intense. So it, it, it explains it. It doesn't make logical sense, but like that report explains like how this has come to be this way. And, and there's also another book called Fentanyl Inc. that was written a few years ago, which is fascinating for anyone who wants to read more about it. Um, and then there's, a, there's an author by the name of Johan Hari who's written a couple books, which actually is right along in line with what you're saying about connection. And then he wrote like sort of the history as to why our drug laws are the way they are and how they came to be in his original book called Chasing the Scream. So just a few uh, resources for you. Okay, thank you. Can I get one more round of applause? Tom, Matt, Rob, Michelle? Fantastic, fantastic. My, my only regret is I could listen to these folks all night. They have so much good information. There's only so much time. Uh, if they are gracious enough uh, to hang around, please come up and ask them questions. Before everyone leaves, again, we've got a lot of prizes here. So many people put this event together. Again, folks from our Safe Community Coalition and our Substance Use Prevention Task Group, all of our participating organizations, there are so many moving parts to this event. We just appreciate Appreciate everyone that was a part of it, from the panelists to the trailers to the tables, the memorial tables, Dr. Burke's Narcan training, uh, everything that was here tonight. Thank you all for being here, and thanks for being a part of it. So with that, thank you. Tom, I have one more important role for you tonight. Whoops, don't want to lose that one. He's going to draw our tickets, and Dr. Burke's rapid response team is gonna, if you raise your hand, if you're a winner, uh, they're gonna run this prize out to you, okay? So hopefully all the organizations, this is, a no, this is just random order, hopefully they have a business card or something like that on here. Uh, this is what you're gonna win. So do you wanna do a mic and read the numbers to make it go faster? Yeah. All right, is that it? Right down. All right, thank awesome. you, Tom. Wonderful night, thank you. Okay, and uh, a couple of our panelists are going to stick around if you do have questions. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Please be safe going home, and uh, everyone stay safe. Good night. Hi, I'm Dan Martin. I'm the Safe Community Coordinator for the Village of New Lenox, and we're at Lincoln Way West High School right now for Your Light Still Shines. It's a big event in support of International Overdose Awareness Day. 
We have a lot of activities going on right now. We have medication take back. We have the Hero and Will County Sheriff's Police hidden in plain sight trailers outside. They give you an idea of what a teenager's bedroom looks like and all the different hiding spots uh, for paraphernalia, drugs, things like that. Inside, we have about 35 organizations, informational tables. People can come along and, and talk to people, get great information. At uh, 6.30 p.m., we're going to do Narcan training. Dr. Kathleen Burke from the Will County Health Department is going to do Narcan training from 6.30 to 7. And at 7 o'clock, we've got some great speakers. Uh, our keynote is going to be Tom Farley. He's the brother of uh, deceased actor Chris Farley. He's going to tell his story and actually moderate a panel of great speakers tonight. So uh, really happy to be here. Thanks in advance to everybody that came out to join us. My name is John Roberts. I'm a retired captain of police from the Chicago Police Department. I probably devoted most of my adult life to protecting communities and people in the Chicago metropolitan area. I think most people would agree that after spending more than 30 years in law enforcement that I earned a retirement filled with rest and relaxation. However, shortly after leaving the front lines of law enforcement, my family and I suffered a cruel tragedy when my son Billy the youngest of my four children died from a drug overdose at age 19. Following my son's death, I'm sure people expected me to crawl into a dark place and live out the rest of my days. But people in law enforcement cannot and will not run from a problem. Instead, I turned and I ran directly at the problem that took my son from me. And now I spend most of my time warning families and communities about the very real threat, the lethal threat of substance abuse. In 2010, I co-founded an organization along with another dad who also lost his teenage son to a drug overdose. We called our organization the Heroin Epidemic Relief Organization, but most people have come to know us now simply as HERO. Today I would like to acquaint you with one of HERO's most popular adult programs, which we call Hidden in Plain Sight. This name comes from the fact that most people, especially teens, usually go to great lengths to hide their substance abuse from family and friends. The, this particular program is designed as an interactive adult education program. And over the last four years, we have taught thousands of adults how to recognize the telltale signs of substance abuse just by learning to look. Over the past 10 years, HERO has learned it is vitally important for parents to be able to recognize the early signs of substance abuse and to be prepared to take immediate corrective action. To this end, Hero constructed a mock-up of a teenager's bedroom in an 18-foot trailer. We then hid various types of drug paraphernalia and fake drugs in the bedroom setting. While hiding these items, we used many of the hiding places reported to us by families with whom we had worked and from tips given to a Hero by persons undergoing drug treatment and recovery. Today, I would like to show you just a few of the very clever hiding places Hero uses to educate parents, and then we will take you on a brief video tour of the Hidden in Plain Sight trailer designed by Hero. Hi, and welcome to Hero's Hidden in Plain Sight trailer. I'm going to do a brief walkthrough and show you a few of our different props. Although an ashtray is not popular to have in a teen's bedroom, some of the items that we have in here would indicate drug usage and be red flags for parents. Seeing little bits of foil balled up or sheets of foil that have burn marks on them. A lot of times heroin and other powdered drugs are sold in foil packets and drugs are also smoked off of sheets of foil. Orange caps like this one come from a diabetic's insulin syringe. In order to inject IV drugs, oftentimes people will use the end of a Q-tip, the cotton, or take pieces from a cotton ball and use that as a filter before injecting the drugs. We bought these two props online and they were marketed as being a stash spot for valuables. If you look at this regular looking tea can, 
the top comes off and there's a hiding compartment inside. A regular looking Aquafina water bottle. But the top twists off and again it's another place to hide drugs or drug paraphernalia. And it easily locks back in place and looks like a regular water bottle. Oftentimes, people will use the casings of pens or straws when they go to inhale the vapors from different drugs, as well as snort powders or crushed pills. A regular looking deodorant stick. However, when you squeeze the sides, the bottom part comes off and there's another hiding place. Balled up socks, another hiding place that's hidden in plain sight right there in their sock drawer. They can hide bags of marijuana and other drugs. Essential oils have become very popular and like this lava bead bracelet, the porous lava rocks are great at absorbing different drugs so someone would wear it like a transdermal fentanyl patch. Vaping companies are always trying to appeal to the younger crowd. For example, we have a book bag vaporware and you can attach a, um, a pod there where you can smoke. This smartwatch, this compartment comes off and you can fill it with nicotine or THC. This regular looking hoodie. On one end of the drawstring, you would attach a vape pod and on the other, you would inhale. And it looks like a regular everyday hoodie. This hat was bought at a gas station. However, in the sweatband, you can easily conceal small bags of drugs and it would be held into place. Another classic oldie, however, still around, hollowing out the inside pages of a book and hiding drugs in there. Or on the internet, they're selling books that have a safe. Same thing, they're just able to lock it. One thing to be on the lookout for, wear marks on a belt that are too close to the belt buckle. That would indicate that someone is using IV drugs. These are just a few of our over 90 hiding spots in our trailer. Feel free to check out Hero's webpage and find out more information on how you can book our Hidden in Plain Sight trailer. Be a hero, save a life. Thank you for watching.